to encourage good people to run, and we have to support the good people who are in office and try to get good folks to get involved. And so that's one of our missions is education. And we will be doing a lot of voter work, a lot of things. And we do have a small uh, little treasury there. We have raised a small amount of money. So we're hoping to be able to do some, uh, some important work with EPAC as well. So, so. and the one last thing, I passed around cards at lunch about the oil and gas drilling at Lake Pontchartrain. If you didn't sign one, let me know and we'll get one to you. We've got some more. Uh, the idea is they want to try and clean the lake up, and we're finally making some progress, and now we want to go and drill full of holes. Thank Question, you. William. No, I was just going to add a statement. When you were talking about politics, we have two phases, politics and politics. And we need to come out and educate the people on what is politics and what is politics so that they would know, be aware of it. I like that. That sounds like it could be a great pen there, yeah. Alberta. <laughs> that's great. Politics that's one thing politics. about politics. This is something Gulf Coast put together on campaign finance. I helped put it together. But we looked at who gave the most money to candidates in the House and Senate Natural Resources Committee. You know who gave more money than anybody else? Freeport McMoran. Jim Bob Moffitt gave the maximum amount. His wife gave the maximum amount. His company gave the maximum amount. And we detailed it. We so what? His puppy dog. His puppy dog did too. That's the way he said, no, we didn't break the law because they were all individual checks. And he said, right. And that's one thing we're going to talk in more about with EPAC. We're doing a lot more research. For instance, for the 173rd PAC, we found out about the under, other 172 PACs and how much money they have, who they give to, you know, how do we go, go, go about being a player in the Environmental Political Action Committee. So if you all want to stay after this meeting, if you can hang in there, we'd be happy to have your input as well. Um, now, I put Joel and Andrew on the, on the spot. Did you, in fact, want to say something about it? I'll say something. Okay. And if, Joel, you want to... Chime in, you're welcome. Sure. Andrew's going to say a little something about taking this real quick. No, not just taking. Oh, not just taking. Whatever. This is free to speak. Whatever you like. Um, along the same line of what Mary Lee was saying about you know making politics not a bad word, um, I think we also have to consider not making lawyers a bad word. It <laughs> seems to bash it. And uh, my name is Andrew Lemon. I'm a lawyer in New Orleans, and I, I represent some people who have been injured by different. Um, by different environmental violations. In fact, two of my clients happen to be in the room. Um, one of them is Ken Ford, who's asked a couple of questions. Um, he's from in St. Bernard Parish, and we represent him in a class action against the four companies that are on the corridor there on the river. And um, one of the things that we've been able to accomplish, it still remains to be seen whether we win or lose the case. But one of the things that we have accomplished, and I think Ken is satisfied uh, to this extent, is that these companies have started cleaning up their act. I mean, they know that they can possibly be hit, you know, where it hurts, in the pocketbook. And uh, so keep in mind when you're making a decision about how you're going to go about handling an environmental problem that you have, that there may be a legal avenue that you have. And, um, you know, think of us as your friends, because we really are. There's several of us in here, several people who have environmental cases. I know Stuart Smith and Joel Walter and others of us. So keep that in mind sometime. Um, also, Skullduck has, you know, that's the legal branch of the Sierra Club. And they've done some wonderful things around the country. So don't forget, we need friends. Um, another thing that came up today a couple of different times is the punitive damages issue. Um, Kip was talking about the possibility of uh, changing the billiot decision, whether the legislature was going to override the billiot decision in the Louisiana Supreme Court. Um, one of the things that I think we need to think about, and if, uh, it's a point that I raised while he was talking, um, I'm not sure if it was really clear when I was saying it, but um, the, the statute now provides for punitive damages if someone is injured in quote, in the storage, handling, and transportation of a hazardous or toxic substance. The question is now before, well, the question is not before the court, but it is before the legislature as to whether that means that there has to be, that the injury has to be from the toxic nature of the substance that they were carrying. 
So if somebody is hit by a train with a train conductor who's carrying a, a train full of hazardous substances who's been drinking, and they get killed because their car is hit by the train rather than after the train derails and the, whatever it is in the train overwhelms them, they're not entitled to punitive damages because they died before the substance killed them. Well, that's ridiculous. The statute is there. It was enacted to, uh, to curb conduct. And the conduct is the willful, wanton, and reckless disregard for the public safety in the transportation, not because of the toxicity. And uh, I'll let Joel say a little bit about taking if you want to. <laughs> Thank you. I can say something oh, about right. takings. Um, I thought we might have a little bit more on the substance of it. Now, you can correct me if I'm wrong because I'm not uh, real up to date on it. But takings is part of the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Um, you hear about people taking the Fifth um, when they get charged with a crime. Well, this, this is the other part of the Fifth Amendment, the same Fifth Amendment, though. Um, and it provides that if, if the government takes away something from you, I think it's on the It's on page one of this, this little takings book. It says, uh, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. And uh, the Supreme Court of the United States has begun to interpret that um, in a more strict fashion, uh, meaning that less is being required for it to, be, for it to constitute a taking, and so they'll that means that the government has to pay, uh, particularly in the environmental regulation field, which is what, has to, uh, what the bills are pending before Congress now. Um, if the person's property is, or their rights to full use of their property is in any way impinged on, then they would be entitled to some compensation. The problem is, is that the government is not in the business of owning property. You know, the government of the United States made the Louisiana Purchase a long time ago. Um, and then as soon as they did that, they sought about divesting themselves of all that profit. And uh, particularly in the West, you know, that was the, the goal was to settle the West. You could homestead and, and you could actually just acquire property from the government by going and using it. And now this same property, if you own it and the government wants to regulate that property, then, then the argument is that you should be entitled to full compensation for the property. But the government doesn't own the property. You continue to own it, and you can still use it. And if later on it turns out that there's something on the property that makes it extremely <coughs> valuable, well, the government's SOL. It's too late. You've already gotten it. What it ends up doing is creating another tier of bureaucracy on top of it at the um, the argument is that it's going to eliminate all of that, but it doesn't at all do that. It just creates another branch that you're going to have to oversee what the value of the property is, what the value of the taking was, and, uh, and whether it changes, whether it actually enhances the value of your property. It, of course, there's no, it, it doesn't go both ways. If it enhances the value of your property, you don't have to pay for that. You don't have to pay the government for that. But if it takes any value away, then they will have to pay you. Thumbnail sketch. <laughs> well, one thing, Andrew, I, I think we ought to clear up too is if, if anybody felt like we were lawyer bashing us, I don't, obviously Andrew didn't think that, and sometimes it's environmentalist bashing, as you well know. I mean, one thing, unfortunately, at the beginning when I started, I'm speaking from my own experience, there, there weren't good attorneys, there weren't lawyers that were sensitive to this issue. That a lot of communities got involved in litigation and it, it went on and on and on and it didn't work out well for them. But then along came the Tulane Environmental Law Clinic to represent people who didn't have a voice before in the legal system. We were so grateful that along came the CR Club Legal Defense Fund who was able to represent people who didn't have a voice before in the legal system. And then through public pressure, I think a lot of lawyers became sensitive to this issue and wanted to represent the citizens who've been impacted. The only thing that we feel about lawyers is that one thing we always need to remember is that they work for the client in that the client should be able to use political action, should be able to speak out, should have a, a part in their decision making. It should be a partnership. And I must say that every lawyer that's in here, uh, Stuart, Andrew, Joel, whatever, I feel that that's the way 
they conduct their business, but that isn't the way all lawyers conduct their business. And that's why the lawyers that are members of LEAN and are part of this are a very important part. And it is a tool. We talk about fighting a, a war to clean up our environment and to save our health, however you want to frame it, Stefan, and each take a tool out of our toolbox to win. Well, a lawyer is a tool, and political action is a tool, and, and a PAC is a tool. I don't think any one tool is going to win this war, but each one of us has to do what we feel we're comfortable with. You know, a lawyer is comfortable in the legal arena and representing this, and God knows we need it. And there's some people who want to be out on the front line, uh, you know, chaining us <coughs> to the gate, and that's Sister Florence, who's also sometimes at the legislature. And there are people like Barbara and Marietta who want to be within the mayor's council or want to be down at the legislature. We have to participate in the way we're comfortable and support one another in the way that we want to interact in the movement. I think that's real important. And so we didn't mean any disrespect. But I do know great lawyer jokes. <laughs> <laughs> as well as Don Juan jokes and all those other ones. But nonetheless, but so, and I've been right there with you. And when we talked about the difference between conservation and environmentalists, when I first started going to conservation meetings, conservation community, not all of them, some of them called me a communist. They called me a pinko. They told me that I was a radical, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it's an educational process where we come together. <coughs> Those of us who have differences who find out that, gee, we really aren't that different. We do have families. We do have children. We have common interests. So we didn't want to segregate the lawyers from our dad. Well, my people would know to say, I love lawyers. <laughs> I love, this is going to become a I love a lawyer uh, thing. I come, from, I come from a family, a family, family of lawyers, but I do want to make the point that what I said earlier, played in Arizona. And I hope you understood the difference. And we did. If you get into a political campaign, which is what, what the fact of a ballot measure campaign is, if you want to win it, you have to talk Arizona talk. And that's what we did. Well, I think, Roy, what you're talking is strategy. It's strategy. strategy. How you choose to frame your message. That's, that's right. different than, you know, saying all lawyers should be killed or yeah. all environmentalists right. should be hung by a tree or whatever, you well, know. He said it better than me, but all of us trip the point that I was trying to make is not to forget that we are also a tool who can help you in your fight. Absolutely. And I'm sorry that I forgot to mention And, and it's fight. a great value. And, 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 you know, lots of people have done really good work. Joe was at the Tulane Environmental mm -hmm. Law Clinic and did an incredible job. And now he's in private practice. And so there's a lot of good folks. Andrew, you know, I've met along the way. Stuart's done lots of good things on Norm for us. Do you want to make your point? You make real quick and then we're going to. Real quick. And that is, um, they're, they're, like we all know, there are kind of two sides to the, to the environmental battle. Uh, one side is more of the public side, which I think most of the people here are uh, focused on. And the other side, as Andrew was alluding to, is the private side, you know, private lawsuits and individual suits of company. And I think that, that both of them shouldn't be, neither of them should be neglected. And I think y'all, us, because I'm a member of Lean and I'm a member of the Louisiana Trial Lawyers Association, have a serious ally in the Louisiana Trial Lawyers Association. And I've always been frustrated that we haven't developed a closer friendship because the trial lawyers, while you can say trial lawyers who are generally representing plaintiffs are interested in, in enriching themselves, they're also interested in enriching their clients because one doesn't go without the other. So um, the trial lawyers fight for the rights, like the Billiot decision, the trial lawyers will be fighting against Lobby and the LCA and everybody else um, and the trial lawyers really do need people's help here. And, and you know, because we're trying to prevent, as and now I'm putting on my trial lawyer hat, the erosion of people's individual rights to seek compensation and, and fairness in the courts. And I think that benefits everyone, and it benefits environmentalists. And I would encourage everybody, I mean, if you need to get a contact to the trial lawyers, you can call them. Thank you, Joe. Joe, Elizabeth, Louisiana trial lawyers and National no, person that's the trial lawyers for public justice. Public that's justice. another thing that we can, but that's not. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, following on that, in, in this handout I mentioned, the latest thing they're passed is loser pays. If you go to a lawsuit and you lose, you have to pay legal fees to the other guy's attorneys, even if you're suing Exxon. So that's more that you know the Republicans want to shut us out of the courts. We already have that. No, we Daryl, you want to bring your that in for us and pass it out? Do well, you mind yeah. getting it? It's, out there? It's, it's on the table. Okay. I think some people pick it up. So it's just the last sheet on, okay. on this one. Okay. So. Well, just remember if you haven't gotten here. Yeah. Yes, I have a question. In, in the 20s, local zoning commissions were the ones that
people, the, the, the basic principle. Uh, well, you, the Supreme Court declared it was constitutional, local zoning. Right, correct. Well, and, and again, I mean, we're trying to, it, it, it runs contrary to the, the, the concept that, that local people should be able to control their, their environment runs contrary to the Republican contract on America, yet these are the guys who are pushing through this stuff. I mean, that should be noted, number one. Number two, the, the, the principle that, that you can't, the, the reason this whole thing poses a problem for us, I think, is because it requires all agencies, no matter what, to consider the cost and to quantify the cost, which is almost impossible, of, of any sort of regulation to protect the public. Um, as it affects property, creates a whole different layer of people looking at that, then deciding on who needs to pay what, and then all the lawyers are going to get, and all the defense lawyers, I should say, I'm not going to bash myself, all the defense lawyers are going to get rich trying to argue in court about, oh, no, we think it's worth X amount of dollars, we think it's worth Y amount of dollars, and that is going to get factored, in, factored into every environmental decision that's made from here on after. It's like, you know, just like now you, the Paperwork Reduction Act in, in, in Washington requires them to say, well, this is costing the taxpayer $4.22 for this, this pamphlet. Now they're going to have to say every time, and, and, and virtually going to have to go out and hire a bunch of land use people to quantify it. And the government is that the agencies aren't going to want to do any of that. So they're just going to stop making new environmental uh, regulations, I think, or pretty much. And that's, that's our fear, I think. And that's the government. Yeah, copy that video, too. I'm sorry, you wanted to say something, Walter? Joel, on the, uh, what I was referring to, is, it, is the contract on America loser pays provision different from Rule 11? Yeah, well, Rule 11 sanctions for frivolous lawsuits. Right. Um, and, and frankly, I'm not in the business of filing frivolous lawsuits, but not all lawsuits are so clear cut where you know you're going to win. There are many lawsuits that, uh, that I know I've been in, where, and I know many people here who, when you deal with environmental toxins and, and the causation, for instance, people with multiple chemical sensitivity, the causation in the, in the science literature uh, is either iffy, to, say, to, to put it mildly. So, you know, you go into a piece of a litigation like that, and, and if you hire me, you know, we're probably going to have some sort of contract where, you know, it's a contingent arrangement. You're not going to put up the money. But hell, now I gotta take the risk of paying somebody else's attorney's fees who's charging two hundred, two fifty now. I mean, does that? You know, the, not, I've been threatened with it several times. Yeah. The yeah. other, the other side of the coin also is that it's loser pays only if the plaintiff loses, because if the defendant loses, the defendant doesn't pay attorney's okay. fees. So it's it's really the double whammy on people who have cases that you know that, that you possibly could lose, and it's going to make everybody have to sit back and take. A huge look, and it's you know frivolous lawsuits are a problem. I think I don't think anybody would argue with that. You know, no one wants to bring frivolous lawsuits, but um, but on the other hand, you know sometimes there are issues that weren't that clear. And you really have to you have to have a result. That's why you have arbitrators. With, uh, that's why you have judges. If it were that clear cut, there would be no need for judges. I, I, I think the main problem really is the issue with the cap because without the punitive damage stick, these companies will spend millions and millions fighting causation. Uh, they don't have to worry about the punitive damage liability. The plaintiff's lawyers are not going to put their money on the table and finance, spend a quarter million dollars taking somebody's toxic court case to trial if they don't have the ability to either settle the case before the trial because of the specter of punitive damages or two, with the potential for a huge punitive damage burden. It's not going to happen. Uh, if these things pass, these caps, environmental lawyers and so the plaintiffs lawyers are not going to take environmental litigation. I mean, I personally, if I didn't have a punitive damage claim, uh, I'm not going to put up a quarter million or half a million dollars taking a case of trial unless I've got the potential to make multi million dollar verdict against a dollar or somebody for punitive damage. So the cases just aren't worth it. What is the damage? Uh, the damage, the compensatory damages, even for instance, if you take a $50,000 claim uh, that's compensatory damage where somebody may have been exposed to something that has temporarily made them ill or something, and this takes a $50,000 case, well, you can spend $100,000 in trying that if you have a potential multi-million dollar punitive damage burden, or they'll settle it. But without the punitives, uh, it's really going to destroy, in my opinion, the final litigation. I'm not putting my money up unless I got punitive damage uh, potential. To add to that, I think that's, you know, all the businesses make safety decisions about
about, well, how much money do you spend on safety versus lawsuits? I mean, really, that's just a, a bottom line cost-benefit analysis, and if they know they're capped off at $250,000 for a punitive damage settlement, we're going to have Pintos on the, on the road again with those exploding gas tanks because they just don't care. They say, well, I'll pay two hundred and fifty every now and then. You know, beats the hell out of spending millions now, but people are losing their lives. Well, the main thing is, is this, is that, you know, this, to, to, to me, this, I'm in a business, this is a business, and I'm not going to spend years of my life unless I'm going to make money, especially when I'm putting my own money on the table. You know, to be perfectly honest, this is not, you know, we're, I'm not in this, I'm not in <coughs> environmental litigation to be poor. I'm in to make money. Now, hopefully, I'm going I'm to make money off the defendants who are doing the, the, the best things. And uh, the problem in these cases is that the plaintiffs generally have no money. And if the lawyers aren't going to put up the money, then there ain't going to be no cases. Thank you. <laughs> I'd just like to add to the reason those Pintos are on the road in the first place is some company made a cost-benefit analysis yeah. that it was cheaper not to fix the problem and defend the lawsuits in the first place. No, so there's your cost-benefit analysis. Well, right. I just think it's disgusting when they use Girl Scout cookies on their commercials. And that is the most disgusting <laughs> thing. <laughs> Factor here of about 20 to 30 million dollars a year. It will 
affect a Louisiana culture. I mean, this, this is something that's going on for before we start keeping any records. And what will it mean as far as the sports fishing is concerned? As far as the average one, I'll, I'll let you two guys out if you can guess that much. But as far as the average sport fishing is concerned, it'll mean about two or three more trout per year that they'll have a chance to catch. Because the, at the present time, the gill netters are only allowed to catch one million pounds of speckled trout a year. And we have approximately 300,000 saltwater fishermen. Sport fishermen. So, to the average sport fisherman, it's not going to give them very much. Uh, well, how is this bill being pushed? Well, for one thing, they're putting out a lot of misinformation about the gill net being extremely indiscriminate in what it catches. This is not true. A uh, gill net for commercial fishing is probably one of the most selective types of gear you can get because the gill net catch is regulated by the size of the mesh. And wildlife and fisheries regulates the size of the mesh so that it won't catch, a, let's say, a speckle trout less than two pounds, or well, not necessarily two pounds, but about 14 inches long. Anything smaller than that, which may not have had a chance to spawn yet, just passes right through the net. And the, the gill net fisherman is the other half of the equation as far as discrimination is concerned, because unlike me, or you, even though I'm a biologist, I have not made a living fishing. I don't know where to set that net in order to catch what I want and not catch what I don't want. But the gill net fisherman has a much better idea of where to do this. So you put the two together. The gill net fisherman knows where to put his, his net, and the net knows what size fish to catch. You don't get the bycatch that the proponents claim that you're getting ready to catch an unwanted species. Miguel there doesn't want those unwanted species either. That just wastes his time fishing. He's got to take them out of the net and release them in the zone. Uh, GCCA has been making a big deal out of the catch of a bottling of salt over in Lake Morn. At least they, they say it was caught in a gill net. I, I don't know whether it's caught or drifted into the net after it died or what. It was found tangled up in a net. And they're making a big deal out of this, but it's really not such a big deal. We have about 6,000 dolphin, bottomless dolphin, between the mouth of the Mississippi River and of those, on the island, 94 dolphins have been found dead in that area. Per year, on average, have shown any interaction with humans, and this includes gunshot and mutilation and, and entanglement, but not necessarily from humans. So that actually catch a bottomless dolphin and gill nets is pretty darn small. Uh, they say it won't affect any other fisheries. Well, we've got, like I said, a little over a thousand gill netters in South Louisiana, and you put them out of business, and they're going to go, probably most of them are going to go into some other fishery, shrimping or crabbing or something like that, because basically all they read, most of them really know is fishing. That's going to just create overcrowding with other fisheries and there's problems there. They, the proponents, well, actually even the commercial fishermen now are looking for a limited entry and a moratorium on any new gill net licenses so we don't get too many people going into the fishery with the gill net. Gill net. And uh, uh, the proponents of the ban say, well, moratorium is probably the <clears throat> unconstitutional, but I don't think they, I, I think this is a, a red herring because moratoria have been established in a number of other states when there was a problem in the fisheries and they've all passed constitutional muster. So I think that's just a, say a red herring. We do need to uh, limit the number of gill nets that are out there, or the number of people that are fishing. And, so I, my personal feeling is we need to establish a moratorium and issuing any new gill net licenses until we can get a limited entry program set up here in this state and then regulate the number of people fishing and the amount that they can catch. But I don't think we need to take the livelihood away from all these people that are now making their living uh, fishing with gill nets. Um, Kind of like, like you said, 
may take a few instances of actual bad happenings and blow them up and make it look like it's the, the main thing. For, for instance, uh, they say that if we don't pass the Gilnet ban in Louisiana, we'll be, probably be the only state on the Gulf Coast that doesn't have one. Well, Texas did pass one back in 1988, but it wasn't the biologists necessarily that recommended it. The agency did pass it. Some of the biologists were so upset they were dying. Just recently, this past year, the voters in Florida passed Amendment Number Three banning the use of gill nets in Florida. So this is an example of where that initiative can backfire because they, the, the proponents of the ban over there, started working several years ago, putting uh, statements in the paper and getting editorials and so on. I went back and looked at all of the references to Florida and nets for about the last three years in the Orlando Sentinel. There were 30 different articles in there, and about 28 of them were saying how bad gill nets were. They didn't give any data, I mean, just, you know, <coughs> opinion that these were destroying the, the fisheries in Florida. And by carrying out this propaganda campaign, they got the um, voters to go from, the, at the beginning of the campaign, about 20% were banning, 72% were finally passed. But it wasn't done on the basis of biology. It was done on the basis of propaganda. The, uh, the marine agencies in Florida refused to pass a ban, so then they went to the initiative route. The agencies in Alabama and Mississippi have also not passed a ban, but the proponents there are going to the legislative route, which is what they're doing here in Louisiana. So, like I say, if you're interested in more detail, I'll be sitting over there. Be glad to give you a copy. Opportunities, uh, the, the circle of opportunity becomes much smaller. And what we're trying to do is work out various programs uh, to create funding opportunities. 
Uh, at the same time, uh, the little time I've been with Dr. Callender, I found that when you take the scientific community out of the picture, not too many people know who he is. Uh, if, when you look at his notoriety in the scientific community, he's known worldwide for what he's done uh, within the toxic arena or toxic. <coughs> So we're also looking at creating campaigns to get his name uh, known on a, on a level of the household uh, level, if you will. Uh, so that's where we're at, or that's where I am as far as my involvement with EOMRI. I'm, uh, I also wear a second hat. I have, uh, well, with my wife, we found that the military issues surfacing in our nation project, and that's uh, an easier said mission. And it all became, or it all came about uh, after the Persian Gulf War. Uh, my wife was a veteran of the war herself, and also a victim of whatever happened over there, uh, whether it's one issue or one exposure, as opposed to numerous exposures. And we have, uh, worked more at a national level than a state level. Uh, we've been very successful in getting uh, public laws passed uh, in D.C., networking with numerous organizations throughout the country that sprung up right after and just before the end of the war. So my working on state level issues is, is totally new to me and I've learned a lot uh, by coming to this meeting. I hope to learn more because uh, there's, there's many issues and, and just a few government meetings that I've been to since I'm in Louisiana, I've found that uh, it is a stack deck and it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a battle, but uh, with people such as you guys and gals and the others that couldn't make it, I'm sure a lot of the battles can be won. So, appreciate it. Uh, survivors or victims or whatever have, have called lean and that isn't an area that we deal with and I wanted people to know that Tony's out there and that there is a group because people have called up and, and you know needed a place and so it's good to know that there is a resource where they can go to. And just real quick Mary, uh, tomorrow night on 60 minutes there will right. be a segment. I forgot to mention that on Desert Storm. That's what? 60, yeah, 60 minutes on Desert Storm. You know what's happened to the troops after they've come back. Oh, okay. and our last speaker, I believe, is, is one's going to be tracing out the broadcast. Oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> There's always a lot happening at the Environmental Law Clinic. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator, Audrey Evans, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I'll just mention a few quick things. We've already met Joseph Franks, our new Urban Environmental Law Fellow. We have soon to be published a new permit guide that simplifies all the the rules for how many days you get to comment and, and things such as that for each different kind of permit that the state offers, the major environmental agencies anyway, and there's a sheet outside on the table that you can order that. Um, we have a new community outreach program person who's just started, Tracy Coons, who will talk to you in a minute about something she's been working on before she came to the clinic um, involving commercial fishery issues. Um, and she's working on, uh, especially focusing on organizing in four parishes along the river, St. Charles, St. John, Clackman's, and St. Bernard's parishes, and has a long history of organizing on, on toxics and other issues. Um, lives in the feet and Cherokee blood. Um, and a few issues I wanted to mention to you. The clinic is now working on, we've been asked to work on a, a piece of legislation to protect citizens from slap suits or strategic lawsuits against public participation. There have been a number of these suits in Louisiana in the past few years. They're harassment suits against activists. Um, they usually have really no basis, um, in fact. Um, and so we're trying to develop some sort of, of punishment for people who, who file these. If you're really interested in some kind of issue or if you've been threatened with a suit or, or whatnot, contact Mary Lee or me. Um, we're, we're going to be looking for a sponsor for this legislation. It might take us a couple of years, but we're starting to work on it. 
No, I was saying that Florence should be our know, first prince. Florence Robinson should yeah. be our know, first victim. Yeah. And maybe Kip Holden will. And Kip Holden. <laughs> they probably will have slapped me, buddy. Slapped me, buddy. Beat you up really bad. Beat you up bad. We're working on that. Groups every year ask us to write legislation, and, and we do that every year, and now's the time. If you have an idea for a bill that you need to have research done on or, um, or work done on, if you're willing to pursue it through the lobbying stage, because we don't do the lobbying, um, just to let you know that that service is available. Um, another issue, Mary Lee and I and some other groups have been involved in learning more about PVC plastic issues and dioxin contaminated contamination associated with that. And there's been a recent Greenpeace press release showing some high levels um, released in, in this area in Ascension Parish, Lake Charles, and there are PVC plants in Baton Rouge and, and other places. If you're particularly interested in that issue, let us know, Mary Lee or me. Um, we're interested in working with citizens and the workers at those plants to try to figure out how to reduce the emissions without losing too many jobs. Um, so talk to us today, especially if you're interested in that. Um, also, I wanted to mention, because I didn't hear it mentioned before, that Newt Gingrich et al. has targeted um, the U.S. Geological Survey um, for elimination. And I don't know exactly where that is in Congress right now. I don't believe that it's in the, the money rescission bill yet, but it's on the list for being done away with. We all have benefited a lot from the USGS's work. And, and as I understand it, part of that funding goes to the Louisiana Geological Survey. They've done some real good objective science work, um, not polluted, you know, and, and politicized like some of the work we get out of the agencies. So if you have a chance, if you talk to your representatives in, in Washington, mention the USGS because you need to be strongly uh, in support of them. And um, I'm going to hand it over to Tracy and let her do her thing. Fishermen, 
the commercial fishermen. Most of them are either high school or below. A lot of them don't have high school education. Some of them can't read or write. The majority of them live below the poverty line already. Um, a lot of them, such as Dulac, the people in Dulac, 44% of the people in that community live below the poverty line already. Uh, Point of Shen and Montague, the communities down there, Native American, low income. Again, the community I live in, 27% of the people live down, that live down the feet live below the poverty line. So when somebody tells you that the taking of their nets and taking of their livelihood is not going to be that big of an impact, it's crazy. You're going to do severe damage to them if you support this bill. Senate Bill 126 is not a conservation bill. It's an allotment bill. It is an attempt to strip the commercial fishermen of their right to fish. Present law, as it is, and how it reads in there, already gives wildlife fisheries departments and the legislature the ability to take gear out of the water, to take the gear away from the fishermen if that gear is causing damage to a species. If the biologist reports were to say that, they already have the right under the law to take that gear. The reason they haven't taken the gill nets through that gear is because there's no scientific basis for what they're saying. It's not about conservation. Now I'll be the first one to agree with you that we need a management program in place to protect our marine resources. The fishermen agree that, with that. Okay? They can, they're out there every day. They see what's been going on for the past 10 years out there. They want to work together to come up with a management program, but they don't want their livelihood stripped from them because they don't know what else to do. The knowledge they have has been handed down over the years, family to family, and um, they would have to go out and get re-educated. I don't think the taxpayers are in a position right now with the problems we're already having um, with money to buy out all their gear, retrain them, support their families while they're being retrained. It doesn't make a lot of sense when, when it isn't necessary. The resource isn't in danger out there. There are other issues, and this is the thing that I've been talking with the commercial fishermen across the state. I've been going to different com fishing communities and helping them to organize, helping them to put um, their groups together. I have been talking to them about toxics <laughs> and the impact these toxics that are being discharged from these plants in Louisiana into our waters is having on the marine life. Now I've heard, seen out there all this stuff about gill nets killing dolphins. Well, that's, that's not having a big impact on dolphin population and gill net. It just isn't. What's having an impact um, in some studies that have come out are toxic chemicals, PCBs, DDE, are impacting the immune systems of these dolphins out there and causing them to die from infections. I was dumbfounded at Wildlife Federation's support of this, especially since the information that I have on the dolphins that are dying comes out of a report that came from the Wildlife Federation. So I'm real concerned about that. And I'm concerned that we don't jump on the bandwagon and try to pass stuff and put out <coughs> propaganda and pretend it's about conservation. Because if we do that, it's going to give all of us a black eye and it is going to eventually cause a problem when we really have a conservation issue out there, when we really have a, an issue that, that we really need support on, people aren't going to believe us. They're going to think it's about something else. So we need to be honest about what we're doing and, and not try to scare people into doing something when it's really not about this. And I guess I'll stop. I'm just going to ask you to please um, go back to your, your groups and talk. And if, at the very least, look at the information that's out there and not just buy into what they're saying about these nets. The Louisiana Seafood Management Council, which is a coalition of uh, fishermen's organizations, stocks, buyers, processors, 
that have come together have proposed a moratorium and a limited, while on the sale of uh, licenses until a limited entry program can develop, be developed. I think we need to work towards management uh, resolutions rather than trying to strip people of their ability to make a living. Thank you. Thank you.